During a relatively recent stream of mine, I went on a darn near two-hour rant about why the Game Boy Pocket sucks, uh, and during that, I was explaining pretty much all of the reasons why the Game Boy Pocket sucks are related to the power input, uh, specifically the fact that it's designed to run off of AAAs. Uh, now, if you decided to torture yourself to sit through that stream, uh, you probably know by now that there are a couple different workarounds. Uh, the best one, as in the most simple and most effective, I think, is to just use um, these lithium AAA batteries. Specifically, I have in here 10 volts, uh, but I did actually just get in those new Jugi batteries that I mentioned. I haven't, I have not tested these ones in particular just yet. Uh, but I have done quite a few tests on engineering sample batteries, these things, and these all lived up to or exceeded my expectations, except for the very early engineering samples. These were garbage, but since those are just engineering samples, it does not matter. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to run through some tests on these bad boys at some point. That's not this video. This video is yet another solution that uh, helps to remedy that power issue that the Game Boy Pocket is plagued with. And what we've got here is another one of uh, Giltessa's inventions. Uh, and what this is, I don't know why, but this was in the bag. There's an LED with broken off pins. I don't think that was supposed to be in the bag, and yet here we are. Anyway, <laughs> besides the point, when you order one of these bad boys, you get a battery plug because it does not come with a battery. At least mine didn't. Um, you get the board itself still in its own panel, and then you get some wire. This is just three conductors twisted together. The purpose of this wire is to connect up the LED indicator board with the main board because this is actually three separate boards. So what you get here, this is the panel. This is, for the most part, nothing we haven't seen before. All this is is a TP4056 charge module uh, that you can wire into the Game Boy Pocket and then you have a USB-C port that you also wire into the Game Boy Pocket. This replaces the stock DC in port. Oh. I forgot there were touch sensors in that. Um, sorry, distracted. The USB-C port replaces the stock DC in port. Uh, you use that for charging the internal battery because once we install this board, you can no longer use AAA batteries. You are limited to um, lithium ion. And it just so happens that I have, I forget which one of these, but one of these was supposed to go into this build here. 2050. I think we'll use that one because this one does not have a battery connector on it. And this one does, but it's not the right one. So I'm not going to bother splicing over a connector if we don't need to. But at the end of the day, it's realistically whatever you want to cram in there. Another problem that we're going to run into and I'm going to try and work around it, but I don't advise you to. If you buy a newer Funny Playing IPS ready Game Boy Pocket shell, most of the work's already done for you. There's just this big battery compartment that you can drop a battery into, no problem. Um, on the OEM style shells, which is what this is, We have this big divider we'll need to cut out, uh, but I will get to that later. Let's go ahead and get this thing torn down so we can start on the build. Let's 
So the un my understanding is that this is actually a relatively simple install, um, but the soldering itself that is required to get this installed, not as simple. I don't recommend starting off with a project like this. If you're new to soldering, you're probably not going to have a good time. And it's not really worth messing up your Game Boy for something like that. Instead, I'd recommend starting out with like a solder practice kit or something and work your way up from that. All right, got that disassembled. We will clean this up later. We'll focus on getting the install done first. And there is probably an easy way to do this without having to uninstall my screen here, but let me pull this off and see what we're working with. If I recall correctly, this is the OSD kit, and I know I did the buttons, which makes disconnecting that not so easy. Yeah. And of course that screen is pretty much installed in there. So I am going to pop that out. Oh, and I stuck it down. Oh, nuts. I may or may not have ruined this screen. We'll find out, won't we? I'm gonna go ahead and desolder that touch sensor. Make my life easier. And I thought of this beforehand. I put the correct tip on the soldering iron for this type of soldering. I am a major fan of the K-series tip when it comes to soldering. That is my preferred general purpose tip, but oh, thankfully it was just a really little piece. Um, that K-series tip isn't so good with uh, surface mount soldering. Rather, not, not surface mount soldering, but for like tinning big flat pads. Unfortunately, it just sucks for that. Everything else, it's my preferred tip though. All right, so let's get started on this. I'm gonna tape this down just so it stops waving at me. But if you're doing one of these installs, I'd recommend, I'm actually gonna tape it from right there, just doing it before the backlight kit. There we go. And that should stay mostly by itself. Let's go ahead and get this extracted here. We're gonna pull, break that off, break that off, and break that. And now we have three separate boards that are still combined, but we're gonna leave them that way for a little bit. Actually, no, that's not true. We're gonna take the USB port off. But we're going to leave these two combined. We have the LED board combined with the um, charge board. And then we have the port board. Port board. That goes right here and replaces the uh, DC jack. So let us go ahead and get this DC jack off. Can you do this with hot air? But I'm going to try and get it out with my solder sucker here. Get that port nice and molten. And I think I'm gonna have a hard time with this. But I'll make it work.
I don't think I desoldered all of these properly. If you don't get it all out on the first try, sometimes it's easier to add more solder and then come back and try again. And the Engineer SSO2 that I'm using here, this thing works by creating a nice seal with the silicone tip. And so if you're using it and you don't have that seal, then you're not using it properly. You're not going to have a good time. I just clog this thing up. There we go. I saw in one of my relatively recent videos or streams, no, as a premiere, um, I mentioned that this thing comes with extra silicone tubing. And like everyone else, I put it in some place safe and I have no idea what that safe place is. Uh, but someone in the comments chimed in and they're like, oh, why don't you just tape it to the, uh, tape to the sucker? And you know what? That's a pretty darn good idea. Wish I'd thought of that. But there you go. Nice and desoldered. I will save this for another pocket because these ports are one of the more common issues. Uh, if this port goes bad, the um, Game Boy Pocket will not boot on batteries. Uh, because how this port works is there's a little switch inside here that when you plug something in, it will physically connect the batteries from the circuit in the Game Boy Pocket. Otherwise, the port will run in parallel and then it will try charging the batteries and we'll have a bad time because alkalines normally can't be charged. Uh, and if you try, sometimes, you know, they explode. Um, so if there's like corrosion or just a lot of wear and tear, sometimes that switch just gets disconnected. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes you can fix it by just unplugging and plugging it in a few times. Not always. So it's nice to have a good spare port. Anyway, that is desoldered. This will go here. And I don't know the best way to do this. I'm thinking we want to line it up and then I'll just tape it down. And we'll try and go from there. The placement is not tremendously important. Actually, I've got another idea. Yeah, the specific placement isn't terribly important because we're going to have to modify the shell anyway. But, uh, wow, I think I just got that on the first try. It's unusual. Um, yeah, we're going to have to modify the shell anyway, so it doesn't matter too, too much. But... Obviously, we want to make sure it's straight. I'm going to straighten that out just a little bit. Nope, nope, I made it worse. There we go. I think we got it. Go ahead and get the other holes soldered.
Don't want to use too much solder because we have to put another board over this. This is the exact type of soldering that the K-tip will suck at. But thankfully, I have this J-tip. Unfortunately, I don't really have a good way of testing that. But at least my soldering is nice and flat. Alright, so let us move on to the next part, I guess. We will need to get this board soldered down and we need to remove any and every component that is in the way, which in the case of the pocket, it's really only these three. There's a capacitor, a fuse, and then a diode. Capacitor is easy enough to remove. We'll just hit both sides. Do that. The diode might be a little bit more difficult. I can't do that with this tip, but let's certainly try. Need to come back and hit those with uh, uh, the braid. Let's get this fuse out. this to be flat. There we go. We want every part of that to be flat because we need to put the board over top. So now I'm going to take this opportunity to clean up this flux that I have down there. Cotton swabs. A little bit of isopropyl here. Clean it up now because I won't be able to later. It probably won't be an issue if I leave this flux here. After all, some of this flux is factory and that's been here for 20 years already. But it's more a matter of I won't be able to clean it once that board is on, so I might as well do it now. Shoot, I should have removed the uh, battery terminals too. I guess let's do that next.
There's no point in keeping those battery terminals. They don't, they won't work. There's one. Save that for something else. Oh, that's jammed. I'm just pushing the hooks through from this side with the soldering iron. Because despite using the solder sucker, there's still enough solder. I'm going to have a hard time. I just have to hit that with the wick to get it nice and clean. And this does not matter at all. I'm just doing it because I want it to look pretty. There's no functional purpose to me cleaning this up. There we go. All right, let's get this installed. We are going to leave the LED board for now. And before installing this, I'm gonna file down that edge a little bit. Just breaking that tab off left some sharp bits that I don't really want towards the end of the board. Can. Might as well make it nice and flush, eh? Ta da! Oh, I should do right there, too. Alright, so we're leaving the LED board attached for the time being uh, to assist with troubleshooting. In case something doesn't work, we need to hit three points. Looks like the top of that fuse, top of that diode, and then right down here. I am going to do the bottom point first. I'm going to orient this just so it's easier for me. But we need to melt the solder on that point. And then walk that board in. 
you know what? There's an easier way to do this. Do it this way. All right, I think we're good to try it out. I don't know which battery I'm going to try. I don't know if it even matters. Oh, that's good. Light means the port's connected. Can't do much to do any more testing. Uh, I think... Oh wow, I'm going to clean up my soldering because this side looks kind of not okay. There we go. Now both sides look good. All right, what is the next step? Let us, I guess let's get the shell prepped so I can get the battery prepped so I can do some testing. We need to remove the tab, just that simple. And now I need to get this divider cleaned up. I'm gonna do this on the rotary tool because I think that's probably the best way to get that out of here. Um, I don't know a good way to deinstall this aside from just sitting here shaving it down with a sharp blade, but I see potential for hurting myself and really scratching up this shell. So I'm going to pause for a moment and go get this done on my uh, drill press mounted rotary tool. Uh, a standalone rotary tool would work perfectly fine for this too, but I think the drill press mounted one should make real short work of this. I'll be right back. All right, so if you're cutting it like me with a rotary tool, make sure to bring the battery because you're going to have to do lots of test fits until it fits. I had to cut out quite a bit more of the battery compartment than I wanted to. Uh, in the color version of this kit, I was able to get away with just cutting that ridge out, but in this case I had to cut down basically to the bottom to get as much space as possible. The particular battery I have is a 102045 here which will fit in the battery compartment once you cut that ridge out, or it'll fit in the battery compartment of like one of the funny playing shells. There's also this 102050, which will get you a little bit more capacity, but you have to cut into the, um, you'll have to come in from the other side and cut out this wall so that you can slip the battery in this way, because the battery just does not fit otherwise. You can see it'll fit once we make some room, but. I'm not going to bother using this one. I'm going to use this one. There's also a matter of 
we can probably fit a uh, fit quite a bit more battery in here uh, this is a 10 20 45 I don't know if a 10 25 45 is a thing but if so that might be good uh, maybe even 10 28 45 I don't know someone have to investigate further uh, the numbers on this battery are because it is about 20 millimeters wide but we have about ooh not as much space as I thought um, 24 millimeters of space uh, so if 10 23 45 is a thing that, that'll fit nicely uh, of course, you can always just cut out the entire battery compartment and then cram as large a cell in there as possible. That'll work too, but this is what we got, this is what we're doing. Alright, so I will need to splice in this battery connector. I think I will do it... Oh no. I'll do it the easy way. So I am just going to splice it down here. This is nice and easy. Never cut both wires at the same time on a battery. You will short it with the tool and then you'll feel like, well, you'll feel pretty dumb. Ask me how I know. Actually, don't ask me how I know. I'm not gonna, not gonna reply. Um, let's get some heat shrink. That'll do. Pin both of these. In an absolutely critical install, it would make more sense to tie these two wires together and then solder them. This is not a critical install. Ta-da! And now, you can plug that in. There. It's not coming on.
That's a concern. Let's see if it charges at the very least. Should be a red light, I think. Yeah. All right, so red light, good. That means it's charging. Now the reason it's not coming on, that is not nearly as simple. Is that, I can't remember. Well, actually, hang on. It could just be that my battery's dead. Yeah, I think that's the problem. <laughs> okay, that is simple enough fix. We'll just have to charge the battery. Let me let me double check that was the problem. Altimeter on voltage mode. Yeah. 3.5. I don't know what just got pumped into this battery, but it was dead. And now we're good. Alright. So last up, I'm going to go ahead and unplug that for now. It needs a charge, but there's not a whole lot I can do about that. Let us do the LED indicator. We will need to remove the stock LED. And you can do solder sucker if you want, but... I'm just going to leave one of those full of solder. And let's get this thing broken off here. So this gets installed. Just like that. solder. I need to remove that. A little bit crooked. Oh, I think now it's too crooked in the other way. Oh, close. There we go. Good enough. Sure, that's soldered down. Yep. Cool, cool. So now we have one of the three indicators hooked up. Let us test it out.
Okay, yeah, it's good. My battery's just dead again. Alright, last the wire. Don't really know a good way to route this, but I think I can run it under the cart slot. Just run it along the edges. Not the best way to strip wire, but it does work, I guess. side so I'd be able to find them. All right, doesn't matter which is which as long as you remember which is which. So I think that can probably get routed that way. I want to leave some of this extra wire just in case. So there is plenty of slack, but I don't know how well this is going to fit in the shell. The way it's going. Yellow, purple, white. Okay. All right, so yellow is depositive. So yellow goes on top. I think we're all done. Flip that back around. Tuck that extra wire in there. That 
way we have some room to maneuver should we need it. And now, last, the most difficult part is getting a hole cut for the port. But while I do that, I'm going to let this battery charge a bit. And if we plug this in, we should have, what, a red light? Boom. Alright. So now, I need to take this very careful of the screen and we need to cut a charge port down here such that we can something's hot Never mind. Oh no, the TP4056 modules are in them pretty warm. Okay. So I'm going to do my best to line that up. You can see the USB C port is just about in the middle there. Alright, why isn't that fitting? Is that because. Those, I think it is. I'm going to try and mark this off. thinking I'm going to cut that on the rotary tool as well so I'm going to take the bulk of the material out and then I'll come back with a file to finish it off I will be right back so I ended up taking almost nothing off with the rotary tool I'm just going to do it all by hand this is what I end up with and what doing it by hand looks like just sitting here taking off a little bit at a time and then doing a fit check a little bit at a time fit check and so on I will be back this will take a while getting closer you can see the port actually sits down there now. I just gotta cut to depth. Almost there. All right, half an hour later, I think I've got it. So that was a lot of file, guess, check, file, guess, check. And I think, I think I did a pretty decent job there. So still need to do just a wee bit of cleanup, but show you how I take care of that. I ended up trimming off these four nubs. I don't think it was explicitly necessary, uh, at least to get all four of them, but they're not doing anything anyway, except getting in the way while I was uh, trying to file away. I think we're finally good to go. 
So let's go ahead and get this thing put back together. I'm going to unplug that for now because we will need to have it unplugged for assembly. Hopefully I did not ruin that screen, but I guess we'll find out pretty shortly, won't we? Is to reconnect that touch sensor. I don't remember which is which. I think I might leave that off for just a second. Or, alternatively, I can plug in the battery and find out. I would like to disconnect the brightness touch sensor but leave connected the palette sensor. having troubles getting this thing to boot. We will troubleshoot that in a moment. Go ahead and get the sensor reconnected. With this particular kit, I don't care to have the touch sensor connected for brightness because you can set the brightness through the OSD, but I would like the palette sensor connected because there's no easy way to toggle the palettes. Like you can manually edit every palette, but you can't just like swap between them with the OSD, so that is, that is the reason for that. Um, another thing, another consideration is that this kit in particular, the OSD kit, there is a bug where if you change the settings and then power it off without giving it a few seconds to save the changes to the uh, built-in storage, uh, it will corrupt the settings and then you'll have to factory reset it. If you have a touch sensor right by your power switch, so you hit it while you're switching it off, it's real easy to accidentally do that. I don't want to do that. So let's... Alright, so it looks like there's more trimming we need to do here. Looks like we just need to cut this off.
There we go. Now it doesn't fit back here. not fitting together still. I think I need to figure out what's going on before I continue. I will be back in a moment. Alright, got to figure it out. Would have helped if I had read the instructions. Um, Got to clear out a little bit on the inside right here. And then, it goes right on. Let's get the power switch. And the battery. Uh, Giltessa in his instructions says just clear out this whole area of the plastic so you can plug this in without having to take the battery or the rear cover on and off. I really don't want to trim that much plastic so I'm gonna not do that. And as it just so happens, there it is. All right. So that LED that I was uh, looking at earlier that comes with the kit, that is intentional. Definitely confused me, but there's a purpose behind it. Let me show you what that purpose is. Take this flip it up we can drop the LED in that hole there spin it around till it fits perhaps good lord there we go ah, good enough And the purpose of the LED is to provide some diffusion for the surface mat LEDs so that you don't just see like a bright spot. Alright, let's try one more time. 
right. Tuck that in there. And then we can have a brief moment of existential crisis while I realize I have mislocated the battery cover. But don't worry. Showed up. It always does. Make way more sense to cut these as long as they need to be, and that's it. But I did not do that. Because of course I didn't do that. There we go. And there we go. And look at that. The diffusion is actually really nice. That's that's pretty clever. Pop game in there. And I can bring the brightness back up. Everything still works pretty much as expected. In the Game Boy Pocket, there's not. Nothing too special about it. Uh, and that boot issue I was having, I have no idea what's up with that, but it's charging nicely, and then that should switch to green once it is done charging. But there you go, that's it. And this is a USB-C host on the other end of this. Uh, Giltess's mod does have the two 5.1K resistors, which means it is charging properly, as it should. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. The only real bummer here is that since this is using a TP4056 module, this does not support play and charge. You have to turn the console off while charging. Now granted, you can use it while it is on, or, well, no shit. You can use it while it is charging, but the TP4056 module will not properly detect the, the battery voltage and it will never finish the charge cycle, which is dangerous, which is why you cannot play in charge. Obviously it works, but it's dangerous, so don't do it, but, you know. It's still a pretty decent solution, and I think I did a real nice job with that port compared to my last go around there. I'm actually real proud of that one. Uh, let me jam a flash card in here. There's an easy flash, and you saw I set it to max brightness. Look at that, booting right up. So yeah, that's that's one way to solve the power related issues. Now, I don't know what sort of battery life to expect out of this thing. I guess I'll have to run some tests on that. Um, I'm probably not gonna publish anything. I mean, I might put something in the notes eventually but keep in mind, the battery life will vary significantly depending on which specific battery you have, which specific Game Boy Pocket you have, which specific carts you're running, and which specific brightness and backlight kit you're running. So any numbers I publish won't be too useful, but there you go. I mean, it certainly works. And I mean, for the amount of work that it takes to install it, um, I'm not sure I can recommend it to everyone, but you know what? It's not bad. I'm digging it. I'm really digging it. Uh, I'm going to have to grab another one for another Game Boy. I, I was very hesitant on which Game Boy to install this in, but um, I think I made the right decision. And even though I had to carve out that battery compartment... Um, yeah, like I said, you can carve out more of the battery compartment if you want to install a larger battery. I am pretty confident you can get one of these bad boys to fit if you were, uh, 
dedicated to the craft. If you remove the entire battery compartment, I have no doubt you can cram one of these bad boys in there. Um, that, this is 1500 milliamp hours versus the 900. Assuming these are accurate in what they're labeled, then that should be that should be quite a chunk of uh, extra battery life. But anyway, yeah, I'm I'm digging it. Uh, so I guess I'm gonna have to thank RGRS Retro Game Repair Shop for sending me this bad boy to check out. Uh, Giltessa for making it in the first place. Um, I will throw some links down in the description to Retro Game Repair Shop where you can buy one of these things. Uh, I will also throw a link down to Giltessa's video if you want to watch his video. And I will throw a link to the PDF instructions, which... Well, no shit, that doesn't work. This is in the Game Boy Color. Um, PDF instructions so you can... It, it's a lot easier to skim through the PDF instructions when you're actually building one of these than either my hour, 10 minute long video or Giltessa's even longer, I think, video. I don't know, it's, it's about an hour. But either way, there you go. And look at that, it's booting my flash cart just fine. This is not the most power hungry flash cart, but it is darn close. The only thing that'll beat this flash cart in power usage would be the original EverDrive and then the clones of the original EverDrive, but I don't suspect most people are using one of those at this point because Easy Flash Juniors are real cheap and they work much better than those EverDrive clones. And it's not a clone, it's its own thing. Um, of course, the EverDrive does work better, and then even better than the EverDrive would be original cartridges, but you know. Whenever I test backlight kits with Game Boy Pockets, I always test with this flash cart because I think it represents a worst case scenario in terms of power usage. And this is handling it just fine so far. So I guess I'm just gonna leave it now, let it charge up, and um, I guess I'll do some runtime tests and see what we can get out of this thing uh, compared to some AAAs. I, I probably should have tested these first because I can't really swap these in now, but hey, I mean, it does work. Seems pretty solid. The hardest part by far is getting the shell cut for this thing, but beyond that, I mean, it's it wasn't nearly as bad as the Game Boy Color one even. I think it was quite a bit easier. Um, much fewer components that you need to clear out. There was just three. Game Boy Color was, I don't even remember, but it was more than three. And yeah, everything goes together as long as you clear out all the required material. So there you go. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a fantastic night.